If the world is a simulation, then you are a real human, not a simulated one. You're plugged in a computer and likely alone in it. Yeah, but how do we know this? Let's start from the top. In 1977, Philip K. Dick spoke at a conference in Metz, France, and he said the following. We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present. Deja vu. In year 1999, The Matrix was released in theaters worldwide. Just a year later, court cases started mounting up in which defendants claimed their actions were a result of their belief they were in a simulation. Court's response was to recognize some as insanity pleas, and the legal teams today call the strategy the Matrix Defense. In year 2001, Nick Bostrom, an author and a philosopher at the University of Oxford, published a paper called The Simulation Argument. In it, he laid out a compelling case for the simulation idea. His argument is really simple. If running simulations of the universe, like the one that we're currently in, if that ever becomes a possibility, then the number of such simulations would be far greater than just one. Statistically, that means we're far less likely to be in a real universe than a simulation. Could we have been fooled into thinking that we are real even though we are not? Well, however real this person looks to you, she never existed. Neither did this one or this one. These are not photos, by the way. They're images built hands-free from scratch pixel by pixel using a generative adversarial network, or GAN for short. They're pixel perfect renditions of human beings made by an AI whenever you refresh the page at thispersondoesnotexist.com. Could we be the animated 3D version of this? Simulated beings that only reside in code? Well, GANs can be trained to create more than just high resolution images of people. Here's how they work. You start with a noise sampler. This noise gets fed into a neural network called the generator that turns that noise into some sort of an output. In case of this person does not exist.com, that output is an image. That image doesn't have to look great, by the way. It could literally be garbage because it's handed off to another network called the discriminator. Discriminator compares that image to a data set of real images and tries to determine if it's made by the generator or not. If it fails, it analyzes the differences and creates a fingerprint of those differences for later use. With each and every failure, a fingerprint gets more and more refined, and the discriminator gets better at spotting the fakes. But the generator is also a learning algorithm, and whenever it fails to fool the discriminator, it references the fingerprint to avoid leaving it the next time. With each and every pass, it gets better at fooling the discriminator. These two networks race against each other to become better at what each does, hence the adversarial in their name. But what GANs learn to do, to create, is entirely dependent on what the data is that is being fed to them. Currently, they are taught to create deep fake videos, write original music, program Pac-Man just by watching it being played, or even to recreate people's faces just based on their voices. That blew my mind. It is not beyond imagination to think that something like GANs could one day be used to create a perfect replica of reality. Nick Bostrom himself does not believe that we are in a simulation, but this guy seems to think so. There's a one in billions chance that this is based reality. Oh, okay. What do you think? Well, I think it's one in billions. Okay. So how much scientific evidence do we have for or against these claims? Lots, as it turns out. But let's make one thing perfectly clear. Living in the matrix and being a sim are two completely different things. A sim is a generated being, its consciousness residing in and being a part of a computer program that runs it. That's it, just code. In Bostrom's argument, the meat that makes you and I is just software. In the matrix, on the other hand, you would still be a flesh and blood you. It's just that the perceptions that you have would be run by an external program. Your consciousness would still reside 
inside your meaty brain. This is important because as it turns out, we have solid evidence that some versions of the simulation theory are just not possible. If right now you're thinking, it doesn't matter whether we have real brains, if everything we experience is a simulation, then every evidence for or against it could be simulated. Well, if you're thinking that, then you might be wondering how you would ever prove that the argument is false. In science, that which is not testable, which is not falsifiable, is not scientific. But Richard Johns, a philosophy instructor at the Langara College, may have found a way to test the simulation hypothesis. In his paper titled, Why Physicalism Seems to Be and Is Incompatible with Detentionality, he lays out what I found to be the most refreshing and innovative argument against the simulation theory. If we are sims, 100% simulated beings, then every thought you or I have also has a set of corresponding states, a specific combination of zeros and ones in the computer that runs the code. If I thought of yellow, that thought would have a very specific state in the computer memory, and it would be different than if I thought blue or salami. What Johns does to prove to himself that he's not a sim is first to imagine that he is. He then tries to think thoughts that can't be expressed with binary states. So what thoughts might not be possible for a computer to think of? Johns' explanation involves understanding claims made by supporters of physicalism, also Leibniz's philosophy of mind, Cantor's diagonal argument, and Gödel's incompleteness theorems. A small part of why it's been more than half a year since my previous video is due to having to go through all that material just so I could understand Johns' paper. Unfortunately, delving into all of the prerequisite knowledge would be beyond the scope of this video. So here's a vastly simplified version. Let's start with words homological and heterological. Homological words are words expressing a property which they themselves possess. Words like short, meta, word, and last are homological. Short is a word that is short. Meta describes something that refers to itself. Word is a word and last is the last word in this list. Heterological means just the opposite of that. Not hyphenated would be an example of that. It is hyphenated. So it's the opposite of what it represents. So is heterological heterological? If the meaning of the word heterological is that it's not self-referential, then we can ask if the word refers to itself. Heterological does not, which describes it to a T. And what do we call words that describe themselves? Homological. The idea that heterological is heterological when and only when it is not is called the Grelling Nelson paradox. As I said, Richard Johns assumes that he is a sim living inside computer code, which means that his thoughts have corresponding states in binary machine language. To show that his simulation assumption is false, he muses on a binary state that a machine should not be able to think of. A state which, like the Grelling Nelson paradox, includes itself but is contradictory. In a separate article, he even gives an example of such thought. Since he is able to formulate it, he concludes that he can't be a sim. As I said, this is a hugely simplified version of his paper and is misleading. For example, the Grelling-Nelson is a semantic paradox. Semantic paradoxes make no statements that have real meaning. In fact, they are taught to philosophy students to encourage critical thinking as they should be recognized and rejected as invalid arguments. But Jones's work is different. His argument is not a semantic paradox. It's a general contradiction. Once I understood his work, I struggled coming up with an analogy that's better than the Grelling-Nelson paradox. So I asked him for a comment. The way I do it is similar to the Gödel mm -hmm. uh, incompleteness theorem in that um, he gets his sentences to talk about themselves, um, but in a very cunning way that is not paradoxical, because um, he assigns a number, a code number to each mm -hmm. sentence using an algorithm involving prime numbers and whatnot. Okay, so each sentence has a code number, and the sentences are sentences of arithmetic. That means that they're talking about the natural numbers. And so, um, because they're talking about numbers, and each one has a code number, 
you can sort of interpret the number, uh, the sentence as talking about other sentences. So, for example, if it says um, uh, there is no proof of the sentence whose girdle number is is G, so it's sort of even though it's talking about numbers, it's indirectly talking about sentences. And then he cunningly creates a sentence uh, called the girdle sentence that says there is no proof of the sentence whose girdle number is G. And it turns out that the sentence whose girdle number is G is that very sentence. And he uses a diagonal construction to ensure that he, that he creates this. And this is not a parlor trick of mathematics, right? Yeah, this is accepted mathematics. Everybody, you know, everybody accepts it. It's from 1931. It's not new. Um, yeah, so the Gödel sentence is true, but we know it's not provable because that's what it says, right? It says essentially, I am not provable. Um, so I use a similar trick in a way because um, the, uh, you know, if we are just machines or if we are just, um, you know, virtual machines within a simulation, then underlying our, our being is just a set of zeros and ones that are um, the representation of us within the computer code or, you know, something similar if we're, if we're just a physical machine. And so um, you can make the same sort of um, uh, construction that leads to contradiction, this definition of this term inclusive that I have in the paper. You can um, make that purely a term about the, um, the binary bits of the representation of a person within the simulation. So it's, there's no sort of funny business going on. It's simply a, a description of, of something very clear and concrete, just as uh, the Gödel sentence is just a sentence of arithmetic. So because it's all sort of grounded um, on something very concrete and, and objective, um, I don't create any semantic paradox. It's, it's an actual genuine contradiction. Uh, if a contradiction arises, then it means there must be something wrong with the background assumption that you made that led to the contradiction. It would appear that the odds of us being a pile of ones and zeros are nil. Not to digress, but I often wonder if I have a child out there somewhere I don't know about. Dad jokes this bad can only be instinct. But what about being sims in a quantum computer? A computer that does not operate in binary. For those of you science TikTok fans, you'll know who this guy is. This little guy is called a diatom, and they are one of the most alien-like creatures on planet Earth. You can see through its skin because, believe it or not, it's made of glass. That's called a science dude. Also not Seth Rogen. I asked him for a comment. Reading into the physics behind this was quite challenging because it this gets into the area of science that's very terminology dense. Uh, when I looked into the quantum Hall equation to try and better understand this, the way it was explained to me is that it is, quote, most likely the result of topological deformations in the pseudo Ramanian manifold of space time. There are papers that have introduced uh, mathematical issues that make it so that the computation of the infinite world that we experience with regards to quantum phenomenon isn't possible, even with quantum phenomena. So hold on a second. What you're saying is that regardless of how large the real universe may be and how much different it might be, it would still be impossible to simulate everything that we as humans experience on our planet just right now. When you're doing this with like it, just individual quantum level particles um, and they interact with each other, the that system as a whole is gonna have a single wave function that describes the behavior of that system, but the number of variables in that wave function is an uncomprehensibly huge number uh, in terms of things that, that the universe has to kind of calculate out. The problem with that is that the many bodies problem, uh, which you know is like a mathematical concept, it has an issue that makes it ridiculously hard to compute. And it's called the sign problem. This is a pretty well understood thing in terms of what it is, but currently there's not a good solution for fixing this problem. And it basically, explaining it as simply as I can, the sign problem is uh, when you have a wave function for a system, right? You need to solve that wave function using an integral, uh, which is a math concept, right? 
But because there are so many different variables that go into that integral, and some of those variables are positive and some of them are negative, unless you run, unless you can calculate the integral very, very, very precisely, you don't actually get any real useful information out of it because depending on where you stop the calculation, you could get a positive result or a negative result or zero because overall they kind, they almost basically cancel out. Um, so the problem is that when you're simulating this many bodies problem, it requires so much thought from the, the simulation perspective uh, that these researchers were able to prove that uh, storing the information of just a couple hundred electrons, that's it. Think about how little a couple hundred electrons is, right? Yeah, it's nothing. Just, it's nothing. Just storing the, the simulation's worth of information about the wave function that describes the interaction of a couple hundred electrons would require more atoms than there are in the universe. That's the kind of complexity that, that we're going with here. The, the key problem that they discussed in this paper is that uh, the more that the system grows in complexity, meaning every time you add a new particle that you have to simulate, the complexity goes up exponentially. So if you have like a, if you had a, a perfectly linear problem, calculating four particles would take twice as much resources as calculating two particles because it's twice as many particles. But when it's exponential like this, that now, you know, maybe instead of two, it's 16. And that's just going by powers of two. It's actually a lot more than that. So when you get up to just a couple hundred electrons, you're now requiring more atoms than are available in the universe. And that's not even to speak of the amount of energy that would be needed. To give it perspective, because I kind of napkin math some of this, even with their new work on making the sign problem less of an issue, um, the amount of computational power that it would take to like render a, a single cheeseburger would still be orders of magnitude more than what's in the universe. <laughs> I like the analogy with the cheeseburger. Right? That's awesome. I know what you're thinking right now. If we're in a simulation, there's no way to know what the real universe is like. We could argue that the real universe has laws of physics so fundamentally different from this one that none of this is an issue. Now, I'm the first one to admit that this line of reasoning sounds more like blind faith and less like science. But it is a common argument made by those who defend the simulation idea. So I asked Cole about this. So the, the original paper from Nick Bostrom and, um, and, and other kind of evolutions of the paper have this heavy emphasis on what they refer to as these ancestral simulations, which is basically a, a post-human society would be most incentivized to want to understand the universe that it's in. So it might play with variations of its ancestor universe, like, you know, the human age compared to the post-human age. But there's not a lot of, I guess, while it might be interesting, there's not a lot of novel scientific content in simulating a universe where the laws of physics are fundamentally different because any information that comes from that, while maybe intellectually stimulating, won't ha bear any relevance to the real world. Therefore, there's not a huge benefit for simulating a reality like that. Well. I guess that nails that coffin. <laughs> that oh. We are not in the simulation. Pull the science dude, busted. <laughs> <laughs> not so fast. If you're watching this video, this is likely the first time you've ever heard of the sign problem or the quantum Hall equation. And even if you did, you, the viewer, probably never did research in quantum physics. What if you're a real human plugged into a computer simulation like Neo from Matrix? And the scientists who claim to have found proof that the world is real are just dumb bots, simply programmed to mimic expected behavior, just good enough to fool you, but with no real consciousness, without physics degree and access to research equipment to probe and test the world around you, how would you ever know? I guess we now we kind of fall back into the no test, not testably falsifiable area of, of the theory. But at the same level, you could say just as easily, uh, and I think maybe less elegantly, that if you were to, that just like in the master universe, whatever the ground truth universe is, that, that they just don't have that problem. The sign problem is unique to our world and that it's, it's a computational error, something like that. 
uh, to try and limit us from being able to build our own simulations or something. Uh, but yeah, I, I can't I can't argue with that point. It's it's a valid point. Yeah, well, obviously the argument that I'm making doesn't work in that case um, because, as you say, the, the assumption is that I'm a flesh and blood person, so um, there's no um, reason why I shouldn't have thoughts, even if I'm right that a you know a bot couldn't have thoughts. Um, there might be some way to test if other people are um, not actually um, understanding their words, but I don't think... A Turing test of a sort. Yeah, something like a Turing test. But the thing is, there's, um, there's a machine that uh, somebody called Ned Block came up with, which is a very crude machine for conversation. It has a, a limit of time. Uh, you know, can only uh, hold a conversation for an hour or for 10 hours before it just sort of grinds to a halt. But essentially, it's designed by um, the programmer thinks of every possible conversation and uh, it stores, you know, a smart thing to say at it when it's, you know, um, it's turned to speak. Um, and so there's no way to tell that you're talking to a block machine because you know, essentially it was created by a human programmer. And so the responses it's giving are, are human responses. It's like a conversation tree in a video game. Mm. Like conversation can only branch into very specific areas. Right, right. Yeah, so um, that makes me think that there's no sort of like Turing test way you can, you know, just find out that the, the being you're talking to is only a bot. Um, Particularly because even though, you know, I think Block's machine is only for a very short amount of text, um, if, if memory storage is sort of unlimited, then, uh, it, you know, it could go for hundreds of years, right? Much yeah. longer than our lifetimes. Mind you, the, the amount of storage is so phenomenal that, I mean, it's not really a practical thing. Even, even a very short conversation would require storage, you know, the size of a planet or, you know, the size yeah. of the universe. So... Maybe I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the real problem that I have with the, the whole argument is that one of the assumptions that this article may or that this theory makes is that we'll be able or that civilizations will be able to get to a point where we could perform simulations like this and not to be cynical, but I seriously doubt that. <laughs> A binary computer is unlikely to host your consciousness, and a quantum computer is unlikely to simulate quantum particle interactions. If the world is a simulation and you're not a scientist, then you are a real human, not a simulated one. You're plugged in a computer and you're likely alone in it. I know I exist, but there's no way I could ever convince you of that. You know that you exist, and that's the only thing that you can be 100% sure of. So if you choose to believe that you are in the matrix, being manipulated and observed, consider this. The simulation architects could have made it simpler and still pulled it off. You could argue that simulating physics accurately would be important, sure. But why bother with the weird phenomena like the Crystal Palace Cave in Mexico or El Ojo, the floating island in Argentina, that rotates on its own. Yeah, that's a thing. It does exist. It is fun to think that there's a possibility that all of those things were created just to fool you. But regardless of whether you are the sole conscious sentient being plugged into the virtual reality, or one of the billions of people living in ground reality, this is all you have. This is all we have. None of us could escape a simulation anymore. We could escape reality. With so much interesting stuff in the world to explore and learn, I, for one, find great comfort in that. Thank you for watching. Hey, gang, real quick. I'm working on a video about an experiment, recent experiment, that literally broke physics or at least it so contradicts our current understanding of one aspect of it 
that there's a Nobel Prize likely waiting for the discoverer in there. If this is of interest to you, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss it. Big thanks go out to Richard Johns and Cold the Science Dude for being in this video. Thank you guys so much. Links to full interviews I did with them are in the description. Also, thank you, Pankaj Saini, for recommending a topic of AI. This video is not exactly what you had asked for, but I was already committed to this topic in the previous video, and I think that Richard answered the question of sentient AI quite well in the full interview with it. Again, it's in the description. Shout out to Lazy Gamer Turtle, I did not forget about you. Andrew Winston, the 1000th sub, welcome to the channel. Apple Dinger, no, the channel is not big yet, but I am working on that. Also, big thanks to all of you who commented on my previous videos and encouraged me to keep going. I read all of my comments, all of them without exception. I don't necessarily always have the time to reply to everybody, but your comment is appreciated and it does not go unnoticed. I'll see you in the next one.